It's great to meet all of you. Thank you. I wish I had the chance to like actually get to know people one on one. Uh, this is not what I am really speaking about tonight, but I want to just share a story that's coming up for me in the moment. You can hear me in the back. Is it okay? Am I projecting? Yeah. So I want to just share a story that's coming up for me in the moment. This is again, this is not really part of what I plan to speak about, but this is really beautiful. Like to see a group of people come together like this, people who are warm and inviting and friendly and eager to learn and grow as people. It's really, so it's bringing up, it's bringing up the following story that I'm really fond of. There was a Hasidic master known as the Vitebsker. So Hasidic masters, Hasidic teachers and rabbis were often known by the name of their town or by the name of the book that they wrote. So if the name of the town, you kind of take the name of the town and then you add ER at the end. So Vitebsk was the town that this rabbi was from. So he became known as the Vitebsker. Okay, that's just how, how it went, I don't know why. And uh, the Vitebsker was once sitting in a gathering like this, a gathering of Jews coming together to connect with one another, to learn, to grow, to deepen their connection with other people, to deepen their connection with God and their, their life, spirituality, and meaning. And he's in the middle of sitting together exactly like we are right now, exactly like we are. And he walked over all of a sudden to a window and he stuck his head outside the window and he took a deep breath in through his nose as if kind of smelling the air. And he sat back down with his group and he, he shook his head like that. And he said, he's not here yet. And I said, what are, you, what are you talking about? So he said, the Messiah is not here yet. I was checking to see in the air if the Messiah had come. And he's, unfortunately, he's not here yet. So every good story has to have somebody who's a little bit chutzpahdik. A little bit, you know, who has the audacity to ask the question. So one of, the, one of his students that was there said, Rabbi, why did you have to stick your head outside the window to smell if, if the Messiah was in the air or not? Why couldn't you just check where we're sitting right here? The, it's the same air. So the rabbi said, the Vitebsker said, because here, sitting with all of you, sitting in this place, in this moment of connection, of, of camaraderie and openness and warmth and people trying to grow with one another and in their relationships and, and with God, in this moment and in this time, Mashiach, Messiah, is here. So the air that I'm smelling when I'm sitting with all of you, he said, smells like the air of Messiah being here. What I was trying to see was, did Messiah actually come for the whole world already? Or was it just because of us sitting here like this that I, that I got that smell, that taste of, of messianic times? And unfortunately, when I stuck my head outside the window, I realized he didn't come for the world yet, but he is here. And that comes up for me, just kind of being here with, with all of you in this kind of setting. This is, this is what it tastes like. This is what we're yearning for. This is, this is what it tastes like in the ultimate redemption. When people are together, they have open hearts, they're connected with one another, they're trying to grow, they're trying to be to be connected to something meaningful in life. That's, that's the taste of Messiah. So I just want to share that with you because that's, that's what's coming up for me. But it actually really connects to what I want to speak about. So there's something called attachment theory in the world of psychology. Anybody ever hear of attachment theory? If you not, it's awesome. Okay, so let me explain to attachment theory a little bit with using what we'd call a foil, right? So a contrast. So somebody named Abraham Maslow. Anybody hear of Abraham Maslow? Great. Are you a therapist, a psychologist? Um, no? Okay, but you're well-read. What do you yes. say? My brother is. Your brother is. Okay, and you're well-read. So Abraham Maslow was an amazing person, and I always feel bad saying this because I really, liked, I really like Abraham Maslow. I've read some of the biographies about him. He was like a really deeply good, altruistic person, and he had some really wonderful things to contribute to society and to the world of psychology. So I always feel bad saying this because I'm going to use him as the contrast. I'm going to show you what the, the mistake he made. He made a really big mistake. Abraham Maslow has something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. People have probably heard of that. In most organizational, educational, and societal structures and organizations, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs is what runs the show. That's what people set up their institutions based on, unfortunately, because it's, it's hugely fundamentally flawed. What he says, the, the hierarchy of needs has two basic claims. Claim number one is that humans function in a hierarchy of needs, meaning there's like a pyramid. You have to first meet the bottom level of the pyramid. Once you've attained the needs that you have at the first rung of the ladder, you can now climb to the next rung. Once you meet that next rung, you can then climb to the next and climb to the next and the next, etc. That's point number one. 
Point number two is that he has a very specific organization of what those needs are and what the order, what the sequence of those needs are. The first bottom layer of the pyramid is what he calls basic needs. Basic needs are what most of us would think of as basic needs. Food, physical health, safety, shelter, clothing, warmth, things like that, right? Those are the basic needs. When a person attains those basic needs, when they have those basic needs provided, they can now climb to the next level of the pyramid where they have some development of morality, of values, of ideas. When they have that sense of self, they can now climb to the next rung of the ladder, which is relationships. And then when they have relationships and they have everything prior, they can now climb to the pinnacle, to the top of the pyramid, which is what he calls self-actualization, creativity, manifesting a person's ideas and their visions and their values into the world, self-actualization. Okay, there's a lot of truth to that and he contributed some very important things, but he had, he missed something so crucial. Because in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, relationships are sandwiched in the middle. They're not the bottom, they're not included in basic needs, and they're also not considered the ultimate fulfillment that a person is striving for. They're kind of like a middle stage, you know? I need my basic needs, which is all my physical, essentially my physical safety. When I have that, I can get relationships, which is then a stepping stone towards that highest point, which is self-actualization. And that is fundamentally mistaken. And yet it still runs our society. It's fundamentally mistaken because the most basic need that we have, the most basic need that we have is relationships is to be in a state of connection to another person. To feel seen and known by another person and to feel that they care and want to be seen and known by you. To experience life in a shared experience, not in an isolated individual experience. And what all the studies, I'm not gonna go into studies and research right now, but what all the studies that attachment theory did shows is that a person can have all the basic needs of what Maslow considered the basic needs, what most of us think of as basic needs, and the system will simply reject it. So a person can be nourished with all the food they need, all the safety they need, clothing, warmth, shelter, but if they don't have relationships, they will medically show up as if they are malnourished in their body. Loneliness has the equivalent effect on a person's health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness and its counterpart, the opposite, the need for attachment, the need for connection, for relationships, for living life in a shared experience with others is one of our most basic needs, not to the exclusion of the, of the others, obviously, right? not, not to the exclusion of food and safety and all those things, but it's right there with them. It's as basic of a need as anything else. The other mistake he made is that he didn't put relationships at the top of the pyramid. He made it seem like self-actualization comes out in the form of career success, having an idea and a vision of, of, a, of a business idea or of some, some contribution to society in some global way, in some incredibly creative and novel way, and actualizing that, manifesting that, is the ultimate fulfillment. And again, what all the studies show is that people have that and they're miserable. Because if they have that without relationships, their system sim simply rejects it. What attachment theory says is that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is true, but you need to put relationships on every single level of the pyramid. So the basic needs of food, shelter, safety, and relationships, the middle rung of morality, values, ideas, and relationships, the top rung, self-actualization, manifestation of a person's unique abilities, and relationships, any one of them that's not accompanied by a relationship is going to be essentially meaningless to the human system. Rabbi Garfinkel ma uh, mentioned that, that, that Torah has, has this timeless wisdom, and I wanted to give you one small example of this. Attachment theory, what I just shared with you about the essential need for relationships, is actually found right in the very beginning of the Torah. There is a saying from the rabbis that says, the world was created with 10 statements that if you look in Genesis, in Breshit, in the beginning of the Torah, when it outlines and describes God creating the world, what verb, what action does the Torah use to describe God's creation of the world? Anybody know? What action, what verb is used? 
I just hinted to it, speech. It says, Vayomer Elohim, and God said, let there be light. And God said, let there be fill in the blank. So God created the world through speech. And the rabbis say in our tradition that how many acts of speech of creation were there? 10. But here's the problem. If you count the times that it says, Vayomer Elohim, and God said, let there be blank, there's only nine. So how do the rabbis say that there's 10? You with me so far? 10 acts of speech to create the world. But if you count them, there's only nine. So there's two answers to this question, but I want to tell you the second answer. Because the second answer is unbelievable. The first one too, but the second answer for our point. The second answer says that right at the end of creation, when most people reading the, 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 the verses would think that the creation stage of the world is over, there's one more thing that happens. We usually don't think of it as part of the act of creation. What's the last act of creation we typically think of? God making man. And when he makes man, this is complicated, but we're going to go with one version of it. When God makes man, he makes man alone. And creation seems to be over. The initial creation seems to be over. But if you count how many acts of speech of creation there were until that point, there are only nine. So the rabbis say, actually, the next thing that happens is actually part of creation. Because what's the next thing? Vayomer Elohim, God said, and listen to what he said in the next sentence, Lo tov heyos adam levado, which means it's not good for man to be alone. And so he creates man's partner. What the rabbis say in this source that I'm mentioning to you is that that's part of creation. So listen to this carefully. When God says it's not good for man to be alone, he's not making an observation. That was a sentence that was a creation. So just like God created light, God created the need for relationships. So it's not an ancillary, coincidental, by the way, it turns out that in this world that I created for all of you, by the way, it's not going to go well for you if you're alone. That's not what happened. What happened is that just like there's a table here, God created a world in which there could be a table. God created a world in which there's gravity. He created a world in which there's water, in which there's a sun, in which there's time and space. He created a world in which there's an existence, like a metaphysical existence built into the basic DNA of the world that we need relationships. That's attachment theory, and that is in the Torah from way back. Lo tov heyos adam levado, it's not good for you to be alone, is one of the pieces of creation itself of the world. So of course, we are, not, we are not at our best when we're alone, when we're not in relationship, because we need, it's built into our basic needs. It's not a middle level on the pyramid. It's part of the most basic need that we have. And it's not a stepping stone towards some greater self-actualization. It is the highest form of self-actualization. People experience the most fulfillment when they're living their lives in relationship. Then everything else on the pyramid comes alive in a whole new way that is so much more meaningful, so much more resonant, so much more colorful and rich and actually hits the spot. But all of those things when not accompanied with relationships are, are empty, they're shells. They're superficial shells. They don't actually give us what we're looking for. Now, relationships come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and forms and, and all different relationships. Right now, we're all experiencing that. That's why when I'm here, if it brings up that story about smelling the smell and tasting the taste of Messiah, because we're all connected, we're in a relationship right now. So in all relationships provide that. Relationships with your rabbi provides that. Relationships with your friends, with your peers provides that. Relationships with parents, with siblings can provide that. And ultimately, there's one relationship that the Torah tells us and that psychology shows us, shows us that really provides the ultimate fulfillment of that relational need, which is marriage. So how do we find that? How do we find the right person? And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, but apparently it's good. A dating app. Oh, okay. got, got it. Got <laughs> it. Maybe. <laughs> but when you're with that person, how do you know? That's the question. So that's what we titled this talk. So until now, this was the intro, yeah? This is setting the stage, what I said until now. So far, so good? We're okay? 
Okay. So we, we need those relationships. We need that connection. We need, we need to be living life in a state of companionship. We need to live life in a state of feeling that we are known, we are being known and we are knowing another and that that person feels known by us. We need to live life in a way that we're experiencing a shared experience of all the things that this world has to offer. Not an isolated experience, but a shared experience. So how do we know when we're in the relationship that we should be sharing all the experiences of our life with? How do we, how do we figure that out? How do we navigate that? How do we, how do we test? How do we figure it out? So what I want to share with you is an unbelievable pearl of wisdom. And I'm happy to give it that type of description because it's not my own. Otherwise, I wouldn't say that. This is just me quoting somebody else. It is, it, this, is, this is a gem, and you should hold on to this and take it with you everywhere because it actually goes beyond just relationships. This is for everything. But it's most acute when it comes to relationships. There was a couple named John and Julie Gottman, doctors John and Julie Gottman, if anyone's heard of them. You probably even nod your head now. What? Oh yeah. man. Okay. So <laughs> the uh, relationship experts. <laughs> so uh, John and Julie Gottman, they actually uh, uh, Jewish, and uh, it's pretty cool because he's. They are the most um, probably well-known marriage researchers in the world, and they lecture internationally and everywhere. He wears a yarmulke when he lectures. It's pretty pretty cool. And uh, and and they decided they were going to try and figure out. Are there patterns that are consistent in the relationships in the world that go well and the relationships that don't? They love these like cutesy little phrases. So like they talk about all relationships start here. Some thrive and some dive. Some are masters and some are disasters. They love all these terminology. So what they said is, can we find patterns that are consistent in the masters and then contrasting patterns that are consistent in the disasters. And if we can identify patterns, we can then take those patterns and proactively teach them to people in advance of their relationships so that they can get there intentionally and not just that some people happen to get lucky and figure it out and some people don't. So they developed what they called the love laboratory and they they studied tens of thousands of couples and what they found is that absolutely, yes, there are patterns. And we can distill those patterns and hand them over to people and teach people how to use them, both preemptively in premarital education, as well as in developing what they call the Gottman method of couples therapy for couples who are d- experiencing difficult times, as most do, and trying to help them be able to increase uh, the, the satisfaction in their relationship. So they have a whole variety of patterns and research. I love, and we, we, we could spend weeks just talking about the, the, the principles that they distill. They are incredibly helpful and amazing. I want to share with you one thing that they found, just one. What they found is this. There is no group of qualities or characteristics about a person that have any predictive power to whether or not they will make a good spouse for you. It doesn't exist. There isn't any. So you look, if someone asks you, what are you looking for in a spouse, in a partner? So you list, well, I'm looking for this, this, and this. Meaningless. All the research shows that that has no predictive capacity. So you want to talk to your rabbi, what should I look for in, in who I'm dating? You want to talk to your friend, to your mentor, to your, what should I look for in what I'm dating? And, they're gonna, and a person's going to naturally, well-meaning, tell you, well, these qualities are what you want to look for. What their research shows is that there are no qualities that have predictive power of a good relationship versus a not good relationship. However, there is one thing, and it's something that you probably would never have thought of. Responsibility. What do you say? (laughs) Responsibility. But that's a quality, somebody who takes responsibility. What they show is none of the qualities or character traits have any predictive (laughs) capacity. The one thing that actually has predictive power for whether or not you will be happy in the long run with this person is the following question. When I'm with this person, how do I feel about myself? That's the only question. When I'm with this person, do I feel like the best version of myself? If the answer to that is yes, and I'll elaborate a little bit on what that means, but if the answer to that is yes, 
you have found your person? And if the answer to that is no, it doesn't matter if they check the box on every single thing you listed in your dating app when you were checking off who, what, you're, what profile you're looking for. If when you're with that person, you don't feel like the best version of yourself, it doesn't matter what character traits they have. If you do feel like the best version of yourself, there's a lot to talk about. That's what they found in their research. Now what does it mean to feel like the best version of yourself? What does that mean? So I think about it like this. And you can think for yourself. I don't know if what I'm about to tell you is true, but here's what I think. My grandfather has this, uh, has this joke. My grandfather is like a old school Israeli, like stereotypical old school Israeli kind of guy, like pre-state, you know, like fought in like underground, like hardened, thick skinned Israeli. When he tells this joke, it's funny. When I do, it's not. But I'm going to tell you the story because I think it has a very meaningful point to it. He tells this story about a, a zookeeper who had a zoo, and a zoo owner had a zoo, and the, 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 the monkey one day got sick and died. And he didn't have enough cash at hand to buy a new monkey. But he needed the monkey to keep operating the zoo. So he came up with a brilliant idea, the zoo owner. He approached one of his employees and he paid minimum wage to kind of pick up you know, garbage on the, on the path in the zoo. And he said, I'd like to offer you a deal. I will pay you double if instead of doing what you're doing now, I'm gonna give you a monkey suit that's gonna make you look like a real monkey. And I need you to go into the monkey thing until I get enough money to buy a new monkey and pretend you're the monkey in the zoo. But like for real, make everyone think that, that there's an actual monkey here. And I'll pay you double. So the guy said, okay, we'll try it. Let's give it a shot. So he puts on the monkey suit and the first day he's doing his, you know, his spiel and his whole thing and acting like a monkey. And, uh, and it's working, it's going okay. He's figuring it out, you know, and people seem to think this is, you know, legit. And, uh, and it's great, everyone's happy. The guy's making double what he was making before. The zoo owner doesn't have to spend money on a monkey. The people, the visitors are happy, it's great. It's going on for days and days and weeks and months and everyone, it's great. And one day he's doing his classic spiel and he slips and he falls and he falls into the lion's cage. And he's lying there and the lion starts coming towards him. And this is obviously not a real monkey, so he's freaking out. And the lion's getting closer and closer and closer. And all of a sudden the lion comes and he starts screaming. The guy, is, the guy now, he's, he's, he's no longer holding his monkey, you know, uh, actor pose and he's screaming, crying for help. And the lion gets right up to him, about to take a bite. And suddenly the lion says, stop screaming, you're gonna blow both our covers. <laughs> And my grandfather tells it with some expletives and makes it funnier, but uh, so that's the story, yeah? Now, I think there's some real incredible depth to that cute little joke. Because what it's saying, what that's really about is actually all of our lives. We are all putting on monkey suits, trying to dress up, showing up like we're something else, all the time, naturally. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a natural thing. We all do that all the time. But the funnier thing when you think about it is, why am I dressing up trying to look like some strong monkey? Because I'm trying to impress the lion. But guess what? That's why I love this story. The lion isn't really a lion either. <laughs> the lion is also just as fake as I am. So I'm being fake to try and impress someone who's actually just being fake to try and impress me. So the whole thing is so insane. We're just going like this, right? But even when it's not fake, even when it's not as extreme as I'm making it sound now, the way that we show up in fake ways, when we put on costumes that are completely different. By the way, that's what Purim's about, the costumes. That's, we're making fun of the fact that we're always wearing costumes because we're always trying to show up in some way to impress people, right? That's why it's like, it, you know, like I, as I, I have the opportunity, the privilege to speak publicly, you know, a, a nice amount. And, and for me, one of the hardest things is if my wife is there to speak, with me to speak publicly, my wife is there. 
Because when I'm speaking, I'm showing up in a certain way. I'm putting on a certain like fakeness. Like I'm making it sound now like I know something about relationships, right? That's like how I'm showing up. That's a monkey suit. Come home and see how bad I am in relationships. This is a monkey suit. That's the point. We're all doing it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just the natural human condition to shift a little bit. When I meet this person who I know is a little bit more intellectual, so I'm gonna shift into that more intellectual part of me. And then I meet this person who I know is more like spiritual and they're into, into like the open, so I'm gonna try and show up in that way. And then I meet this person who I know is like really into, I don't know what, and I show up in, in that way. And we're always shifting, even if it's not super extreme, right? When it's really extreme, then there's really a problem and, and it's, it's okay, it's understandable that comes from somewhere. But that's really something to address, and, and people struggle with that. People struggle with shifting really extreme to different contexts, and they really don't have a sense of self. And they don't know how to be able to be confident enough and secure enough in themselves to show up genuinely as who they are in a consistent way. So they're always putting on completely different, one day it's a monkey suit, one day it's a lion suit, and one day it's a, this costume and that costume, right? And it's extreme. That's really, we need, we need to get inside to figure out what's going on there and try and help that person. And that's okay if that's you, that's okay. But that needs to be addressed in a deeper way, right? But even in a more simple way, we're all doing this by angling all the time in slightly different ways. So we might have a solid core, but we, we shift, right? So we all have different versions of ourself is really what I'm essentially getting at. We have different versions of ourself, different parts of ourself that show up differently in different contexts and different times. What the Gottmans are saying in their research is that when you're looking for your life partner, for your spouse, for the person that you are most fundamentally going to be sharing your life experience with. For the person who's going to be that relationship that goes along with every level of the pyramid like we spoke about. The person who, who's, who's, who is knowing you and being known by you. The person who you are seeing and being seen by. The person who you are opening yourself up to share the richness and the, the fullness of your life with. That person has to be the person that when you're with them, you don't feel the need to put on any of the costumes. You feel comfortable just being the self that doesn't need to dress up in a certain way. Something about this person, something intangible about this person creates a felt sense in intuitive knowledge, something that goes beyond the list of pros and cons which is the way that most of us are taught to make most decisions, by making pros and cons. But all of that is using our rational brain. And relationships aren't just about a rational brain, they're about a deeper connection. So it's about connecting to that inner, that body wisdom, that intuition, <clears throat> that, that knowledge that comes from a place that's deeper than a list or an analysis, that says to me on a natural and intuitive level that when I'm with this person, I can drop all of that. I can just be the self that feels most natural. The self that feels like my best self. That doesn't mean that it always feels perfect, like that this person makes me feel like a million dollars all the time. That's not the same thing. Because if I'm my fullest, best self without the costumes, that actually means I'm more comfortable looking at my weaknesses also. So it means that when I'm with this person, I feel so comfortable that I can actually engage the things that are challenging for me too. I can actually look at my insecurities. When I'm with this person, I'm secure enough to be insecure and strong enough to be weak. I'm confident enough to, sh to see where I'm actually really not confident. So it's not about just feeling good. It's deeper than that. It's more holistic than that. It's the sense that I can be the best version, the fullest, most natural version of myself. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's part two of what I wanted to share. I have one more part three and then we can take a break and then and then have a conversation about it. Is that okay? Is it okay if I ask a question about part two? Before yeah, you? yeah, yeah. What's your take on that? If you, from a Jewish perspective, if you were to have met someone that's not like a Jewish woman, like say I met a Jewish woman, and that's and that person makes me feel that way, but she's not Jewish, mm. then what's the, it's like, well, are there multiple people out there that can make you feel that way, and should you be targeting religion, or is it, just kind of like a, it's a good you, question. You find, it, you find it first, and you're like, "Well, there's no point in looking for grass is greener." Like, you're right. That's a good question, and that's a hard question. I think, I think, and I, I don't know. I, I know, but uh, 
it's pay grade higher than me. But I think the answer to that is that, that there's somebody else out there that's Jewish that, that also does can, can provide that for you. I think. Sounds like a real rabbi answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, the real rabbi answer is, what do you think? Tell me more. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think... But it's a good, it's a, it's a tough question. Because then it's like, all right, well, then how long do you wait? Where do you find it? Do you just keep hoping? What if you never find it? Then you live with, you know. I'm not saying it yeah. applies to me. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I hear it. Sure. It's, it's challenging. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, even within, within uh, you know, if both people are Jewish, there can be situations like that where, you know, Torah law might not allow for a certain relationship and a person can, it, it, there's a lot of challenging situations like that. Um, you know, hopefully not not too often, but there are challenging situations like that. Um, but I think that um, you know what what got like the way Ray Garfinkel was saying in the beginning is the master architect is giving us the instruction manual. He kind of knows, you know, so this one's not actually the right relation. It might seem that way, but it's not actually right. And so there's someone else out there that can provide that. I think. You know, guys don't like to read instructions. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, okay, so here's the part three, yeah? Is that okay if I do a little bit more? <clears throat> am, I, am I losing my board? Am I, am we're okay? No, okay. No. No. Cool. Um, I just know that I wouldn't want to listen to myself speak for this long, that's why I feel bad. Uh, okay, so, so part three is this. In order to access that knowledge, I believe that we have to address and, and, and face an aspect of ourselves and an aspect of our culture that, that really needs some work. Now, I don't wanna make any assumptions about any of you, I haven't really met too many of you to get to know you very well, but most people, I think, and I know this is true about myself, most of us are really programmed to rely very, very heavily on a very small part of the human brain in the way that we think about things and make decisions and live our lives. And that very small part of the human brain is the analytical, rational, thinking brain. That conscious thinking brain, what sometimes we call the prefrontal cortex, or sometimes we call the left brain, whatever it might be in a neuroscience way, but it's that part of the brain. The reason for that is, is, is I think, is because educationally, we spend so much of our developmental years being trained to put everything into that. That's what really matters, right? When do arts and crafts end in school? In like kindergarten or first grade? Like right now I have like, I have a, I have a, a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a five-year-old, and a three-year-old. But, and, and so like my five-year-old comes home with like a, a school bag full of like drawings and like very artsy type things, right? My nine-year-old used to, but doesn't, at all, but doesn't anymore, at all, like zero, right? That doesn't happen anymore. No one does that, that'd be weird, right? It shouldn't be, but it would be. It doesn't go on. So for the first like five, six, seven years of our lives, we are being introduced and we are engaging the parts of our brain that are more creative, more intuitive, the right side of our brain, the limbic system in our brain, the emotional part of our brain, all those kinds of things. For some reason, the educational system decided that when we get to first grade, goodbye right brain, goodbye limbic system, goodbye emotions, goodbye all of that. Now we just focus on getting good grades on tests. Organizing information, analyzing information, writing well, learning grammar, math, history, science, all these things that are only one tiny fraction of the human being. They're all very, very important. I, I love this stuff. I, it'll be, it, it's great. I majored in philosophy in college. I love the analytical thinking. I'm really interested in this stuff. But it's only one part of the human experience. And everything else is forgotten. So we're not really taught what it means to trust our intuition, to pay attention to our feelings, and to knowledge that goes deeper than what I can tangibly prove to you. Knowledge that comes from a place that's deeper than a list of pros and cons. Knowledge that comes from a place that I can't really explain. Intuition. It's a lost art. It's something that we're just not part of our society. It's not part of our educational system. 
but it's so profound and it's so important. I'll tell you something amazing. Have you ever heard of the Gra or the Vilna Gon? Mm-hmm. Rabbi Elijah Kramer was known as one of the greatest geniuses ever in, in history. Lived when? I don't know how long ago? Rabbi, how long was the Gra? 300 years ago. He writes the following unbelievable statement. He says like this. He says, back in the times when there was prophecy, a person wanted to figure out what's my mission in this world. How am I supposed to live my life? Where am I supposed to live? Who should I be married to? What should I do with my life? What's my spiritual purpose? And what would they do? They would go to a prophet and the prophet would tell them. Prophecy ended. So now we no longer have access to that. But then here's what he says. It's not true that we no longer have access to it. When prophecy ended, God took prophecy away from the prophets and he implanted it into the intuition of every individual person for themselves. So the very same knowledge that you would have gotten by going to a prophet, you can find within yourself if you pay attention to intuition if you're open to your own intuition. We are not very good at that. We don't do a lot of that. But relationships aren't about utilitarian needs and checklists and, and, and all that kind of stuff that our, that our left brain or prefrontal cortex, our analysis, our lists can tell us what the right relationship is. Relationships are about something so much deeper than that, so much more connected to that. It's about that shared experience. And so the only guide that can really tell you if this person's the right person for you is the question that the Gottman's found in their research. It's the question that your intuition can answer, not your brain. It's the question of when I'm with this person, do I feel like the best version of myself? Intuition tells you the answer to that question. In my, in my therapy work, I find this all the time with people. It's very, it's very unfortunate. One of the areas that I, that I specialize in working in is what's called sex addiction. So I work a lot with people who struggle with sex addiction. I work with couples, and I work with the partners of sex addicts, and I work with sex addicts as well. And what I find again and again and again is that the partner of the addict, the addict has been lying, has been doing all sorts of things, and the partner, when they find out they always knew already, but they didn't trust their intuition. Just the other, just the other week, I had a new, a new couple come in. The, stereotypically, the addict is usually the man and the partner who's betrayed and traumatized is usually the, the woman. This is actually the opposite case. This guy was waking up every night for weeks having nightmares that his wife was cheating on him. And he had no idea why. He didn't see like texts or an email or capture or have a PI or something like that. He was just intuitively waking up in the middle of the night with that knowledge. Like something's wrong here. But guess what he did? And I'm not blaming him. Guess what he did? Nothing. He ignored it. He just thought it was a nightmare. Understandably, because none of us are ever taught to trust our intuition. To pay attention to knowledge that doesn't come from concrete knowledge. And and I give you that example, but I can give you dozens of examples like that, where people have intuitions, they have knowledge that they don't have concrete data for, and because of that, they ignore it. And they use their rational mind to rationalize to to the conclusion they want to have, and they ignore and neglect the intuition that was trying to give them information that they so desperately needed. We need to try to open ourselves up a little bit more beyond the confines of concrete data and knowledge in that way, especially when we're in the search for relationships. Because it's actually our intuition that is our guide. I'll just finish up by telling you one personal story. When I look back on my life and I look at the mistakes of different things, if it's okay, I'm gonna give you two examples. Before I get to the mistakes, let me tell you a cool example, yeah? This is, this is a cool one, okay? I was not planning on becoming a therapist at all, it wasn't even in my mind's eye, it wasn't on the table. I was becoming, planning on becoming a, uh, a pulpit congregational rabbi, 
and uh, I did ordination and all that, studied for it, started, got some assistant rabbi jobs, bunch of detours, landed me in a place of like, okay, I'm not interested in that anymore, okay? Then I decided I was gonna go for a PhD in, in Jewish philosophy, actually at University of Chicago. I was told I had an in, I was like set up, I was good to go, I was gonna go in that direction, and then I got a rejection letter. Didn't work out, okay, so hit another detour. Whole bunch of detours, and I ended up being okay, I'm gonna try and get a, a master's in social work, and we'll see what happens. I did that. I still remember the feeling I had the first time I was sitting in the chair as the therapist at the very first session, the woman never came back for a second session. So either I did a terrible <laughs> job or I did an amazing job. <laughs> Probably the former, but we'll go with the latter. And, uh, and, and your intuition said. Yeah. <laughs> My intuition says I did a terrible job. <laughs> the, the, but I remember the feeling, I still remember, of that first session, of that first time sitting there. And I felt in like this deep, intuitive, resonant, felt sense way, not up here, but like a full body knowledge. This is like the most at home that I've ever felt. Sitting here in this capacity, in this role, I feel so intuitively right. It just feels aligned, it feels right for me. In a way that all the other things I had been pursuing never felt that way. They, they didn't feel that way at all. The, the PhD at University of Chicago was such a monkey suit moment. Such a monkey suit moment. The pulpit rabbi thing, maybe a little bit less, maybe in between, but this really just in deeply felt right. Not in a way that I could say to you, here's why it's right over the other things, but in a felt sense. But here's the cool story, the cool part of the story. A couple of years ago, so this is a few years after the story, just after the, the, that first session, sitting there and having that awareness and having that moment, I was back at my parents' house in New Jersey, and I found my eighth grade yearbook, and which I hadn't seen in years. And you know how like in yearbooks, sometimes they have that page of like what you're gonna be in 20 years from now, mm -hmm. right, what you wanna be? And by Yakov Danishevsky, lo and behold, what did it say? A psychologist. Mm -hmm. So guess what? My eighth grade self intuitively knew so much more about what I actually needed in my life than my 20 year old self applying for a PhD. Because I didn't intentionally up here choose to become a therapist. Thank God, God guiding me towards that. But my eighth grade self knew it because my intuition actually knew it. That's the first story. The second story is when I was, again, a story in my journey of as a therapist. When I was, when I was, uh, and, and I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, when I was uh, working, in, I was working in one practice for, for somebody in a, in a group practice as an associate, and uh, somebody approached me with an opportunity to join a new practice that they were starting, and they gave me like a whole spiel, a whole offer of like why this is such an amazing opportunity. They offered me a lot. They offered me a, a nice amount of money more than what I was getting paid at the time, and a whole package, and they they pumped me up. There was a whole thing. And they made it really enticing. So up here on the checklist of things, it was all right. It was all good. There was it was it was all good reasons to go and switch practices. But I knew that there was I felt there was something that wasn't right about it. There was something about this woman that was not that was not for me. Something wasn't right. I didn't know what. And at that point in my life I hadn't learned about anything I'm telling you now. So I had no sense of this idea of trusting intuition and paying attention to what feels right. I was just up here. I was like way up here. By nature, by the way, nothing, again, this is a monkey suit. I'm not good at anything I'm telling you. I'm very, very stuck up here, okay? So I was the type of person who's just up here. I felt something, but I didn't trust it. So I took the job because on paper, I couldn't tell you. If you would ask me what was not okay about her, what was not right about this job, I couldn't have told you anything concrete. And concrete, on a concrete level, on a checklist level, everything was amazing about it. So I took the opportunity. Lo and behold, it was a terrible experience. She was a profoundly abusive supervisor and boss. It was a, it was a nightmare, it's a truly terrible experience. And my intuition knew it the whole time. It knew it the whole time. And every time I look back on a decision that I regret, I always, I can always, I can always see that. And obviously you could say there's some Monday morning quarterbacking going on in that, right? which might be true, but to some degree, I really believe it's true. 
When I don't trust my intuition and instead I allow my mind to rationalize my way into what I actually, what my mind is capable of, con of contriving, I make a mistake. When I really pay attention to what I told you before in the name of the villain, the go and of this, this great sage, that we actually have prophecy that's implanted within us, that our intuition, that our body, that our deeper knowledge and wisdom knows we really are able to find the right way for ourselves in life. And when it comes to relationships, this pearl of wisdom from the Gottmans that I, I personally cling to since I've heard it because I think it's so incredibly profound and just hits the spot, is that what you want to tune into when you're looking for relationships and you're trying to figure out where is it right for me? Is this person right for me? Do I want to continue? Do I not? Is this the right setting for me? And this is true in terms of romantic relationships and it's true in terms of everything in your life. The question is when I'm with this person, intuitively, when I'm with this person, do I feel like I'm the best version of myself? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I guess we'll take a few minute break. Um, um, okay, before I jump to that, yes. just one quick note that I wanna, sometimes I get very passionate about an idea and I sometimes can get very, I want to make sure that I don't say it in a way that's too extreme. You know, sometimes in, in, when you're speaking, you try to, you know, make it dynamic, you know? Um, so some, a comment that somebody made that I want to, so I want to um, just qualify one thing I said. The idea is not that intuition becomes the only thing that matters. The, the, the thinking part of our brain is also very important. The point is for them to all be online and to all be trusted in conversation with each other that there's an integration of it. Just to give you one little explanation of this, if you look at the brain scans, what a lot of the modern neuroscience, the world of neuropsychology shows, is if you look at brain scans of people who have profound trauma and have PTSD, or people who have high levels of addiction, etc., what you'll see is that when one part of the brain is lit up, the other parts are completely dark. And when the other part of the brain is lit up, then the, then the, the first parts are completely dark. So their brains, part of what PTSD is, is that the brain functions in a very disjointed way. So there isn't integration of the different parts. It's like if this is on, then everything else is off. And then if this is on, everything, everything becomes very compartmentalized. What I was talking about before is not that intuition becomes the only thing, but that intuition becomes a very, very significant part in relationships, it becomes an even more significant part. I think in life choices in general, it becomes a very significant part. But the point is that in really healthy functioning brains, what the neuroscans neuro show is that all the parts are lit up together. Sometimes one part will be lit up even more and the others will be dimmer. And sometimes a different part will be on a higher light and the others will be dimmer. But they're never or almost never just one or the other. There's integration of the whole self. Healthy human functioning has integration of the whole self. So I wanted to just give that qualification so that I don't sound misleading of like, you know, saying it in, in a way that's too extreme before. Come to your question in one second, is that okay? Right. Yeah, so yeah. let me just do a regarfing glass and then we'll start with your question when we do the, the conversation, okay? So uh, in terms of the book, thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Um, thank God, it's really exciting. We're actually already, we're, it's only like five, six weeks after uh, it, it, it was uh, published and uh, we're starting a second printing. So thank God, this is actually one of the only places you could still get the book. Um, it is, uh, thank God, it's, it's sold out. Um, really appreciative of that, it's really exciting. And uh, so the book is called Attached because it is a play on what we spoke about until now called Attachment Theory, as well as the mitzvah, the commandment in the Torah, uh, what's called Dveikot, or Dveikos, which means attachment to God. Like glue in Hebrew is debek. And there's actually a verse in the Torah, there's actually five times that the Torah talks about attaching yourself to God. And so what I did in this book is I tried to take the psychology of relationships, a lot of what we just spoke about and a lot of other things, the psychology of relationships. And what I said is let's imagine that instead of sitting in front of me is, is a couple, is a husband and wife that came to me for couples therapy, let's imagine that, the, that there's a person sitting in front of me on the couch and next to that person is God. And they came to me for therapy to build a closer relationship. What happens if we apply the psychology of building deeper, more meaningful relationships to a person's relationship with God? And what if that companion and that shared experience that we were talking about until now doesn't only need to be with other people, but it can also be with God. 
and that God can provide that companionship in life in a way that is incredibly unique, not to the exclusion of with other people, but in addition to that, in a way that's profoundly unique. And what I'm actually claiming is that actually that's what Judaism is all about. That's not just like, a, oh, by the way, God can, that is what Judaism is about. What all of the mitzvot and all the practices and all the holidays and all of Judaism is actually really about one thing. Developing a relationship, an attachment to God. Living your life in a shared experience with God. Knowing God and being known by God. Applying all the Gottman principles, applying all the attachment theory, applying psychology of trauma and personal growth, applying all of that to how we develop a closer, more meaningful relationship with God in a way that can really enhance our lives. So that's what the book is about, and I think that it hopefully has uh, something to offer uh, for people to develop that relationship with God, as well as their own personal growth and relationships with other people as well. That's the idea of the book. Uh, the, the, the podcast, thank you for asking about that. And anybody, whether you're buying the book or not, please please take a one of the, the, the brochures that has all the information about the podcast, um, then where you can find it, is a variety of different ways that I'm trying to share these types of ideas. So whether it's through guided meditations, or it's through conversations with guests that I bring on to discuss different ideas, or it's before each of the holidays I do an episode discussing the holiday through this kind of psycho-spiritual, psychological Jewish lens. Uh, trying to share. I have my Apple ideas. Podcast open, Rabbi. Tell me, bring it on. What, how do we get on Apple? You go to Attached on Apple Podcasts, and Attached has a channel on Apple Podcasts. And there's also a website, Attached Living, which has all of it and has all my talks. Of, attached you know, Podcast? Um, attached, yeah. No, just Attached. If you do it on Apple Podcasts, it should show up. Okay. It might not be the only one because Attached is, uh, but it'll it'll have the image of the cover <laughs> of the book. And, I tried to it. it's and there's a cute, Attached Podcast. It's just called Attached. Okay, got it. Got it. Um, there's a QR code on the on the brochure as well that you will take you straight there. Um, and there's also a uh, if anyone's interested, there's a there's a WhatsApp um, broadcast group. That way, I whenever I post something, um, I I, uh, I I post on there so you can subscribe to the WhatsApp group. Would love to uh, have all of you join the the attached. Uh, Attached movement, if you will. <laughs> I've never it's called community. it that before. But, uh, <laughs> it was born here tonight. Born here tonight. The, tonight. <laughs> the attached movement. There you go. Okay, we're excited. I just. Awesome. I'm, I'm following. Thank I'm sorry. you so much. Amazing. My pleasure. Okay, so you had a question. Yes. Yes. So when or you talk comment. about intuition and the logical side of the brain and whatnot, where does emotional intelligence or emotional quotient fit into that? Yeah. Is that like a softer side of logic? Is that more intuition? Like the whole idea of being able to read people to go beyond, um, you know, the face value. Yeah, good question. I think that it is more connected to intuition. Um, I think that intuition is, is something like even deeper than the rational brain and the emotional brain. I think it's something that comes from an even, maybe even a spiritual place. Um, that's difficult to identify in the brain. I'm not sure. I don't know. This is, you know, who, who knows? Uh, but I think that emotion is more already leaning towards the intuitive side of things. Uh, but I think intuition is, is also a little different than emotion. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I like your revised Maslow framework with mm -hmm. the relationships at each rung. Thank you. Um, the thing that I kept thinking was it, it, it does put a lot of pressure on people who might not have like a ton of friends or certainly people who don't have a romantic partner. And I think a lot of people also talk about the value of kind of being alone in solitude and you know working on your own self and not having your happiness be contingent on the approval of, of someone else. Mm -hmm. So where does that kind of concept yeah, such a good question what yeah. you're saying? Excellent question. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me take that in two parts, if that's okay, because I, I heard two things in what you were bringing up. The first thing you were bringing up. Is it possible to repeat the question for the mic? Yes, sure. <laughs> the, mic. Uh, the question, if I heard it correctly, yeah, yeah. I apologize if I paraphrase incorrectly. Uh, the first, at least the way I heard it, was the first part of the question is, is what about when a person uh, doesn't have so many relationships and does this create a pressure and what should they do with that? A uh, person doesn't have a romantic partner or just in general doesn't have so many relationships. That's part one. Part two is, isn't there also a value in being able to have solitude and spend time by yourself and, and all those kinds of things and not and not be completely dependent on the approval of others, et cetera, yeah. So those are the, that's I'm breaking into those two parts. So in terms of part number one, uh, the, the pressure, I think is a word you use for people when they don't have a lot of relationships, I would really just try and reframe it as not being a pressure. It's, it's something to really make sure that we value. 
And the reason I, I would emphasize it, but not as pressure, but as, as something that's really important and as an opportunity is because again, societally, I, I don't know that it's always, it's always portrayed as one of the most important values. People are always chasing relationships, but, but career success and uh, being an entrepreneur and self-actualization are things that people pursue at the expense of, of, of prioritizing relationships. And uh, you know, my favorite, if, if anybody's seen it, David Brooks has a TED Talk. David Brooks, right, the author, and uh, he, he, has, he has a book called The Second Mountain, but he has a TED Talk I really encourage listening to. Like, it's 12 minutes or something. The book, obviously, is like you have to read a whole book. Um, read my book. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but the TED Talk I really encourage listening to. It's all about his experience of, of having reached the height of his career success. Uh, but experiencing that he only had work friends and no life friends, that's what he calls it, and that his kids had all gone off to college. I think he had just gotten divorced and he was profoundly alone, and despite having the highest level of success as an author, he was just utterly depressed and he reinvented his whole life around that. But I don't think that that's a pressure, I think it's, it's a value. Uh, I, I understand how it, how it could be, if someone could experience it that way, but I think that's just the way to, that's, you know, to reframe it, not as a pressure, but as, as a value that we want to we pursue. And to make sure that that's something that we, we, we prioritize in our lives is to make sure that we have time for relationships and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, and, 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 and if a person doesn't have it, so to, to, to look for it, right? So, which is not always easy. I'm not trying to make it sound easy. It can be very challenging sometimes for different circumstances. It can be very challenging. But the, the important part is that if I recognize how valuable and important this is, then it could be challenging, but I still maintain the motivation and the focus on pursuing this because I see how, value it is, how, how valuable it is. So it can be challenging, but I'm not giving up on this because this is not something that's just like a, a take it or leave it thing. This is fundamental to my existence. Uh, in terms of the, the, the need for independence, uh, so that's a great question. I think that we do need that. Uh, we do need the ability to spend time by ourselves. And there's a balance. So they, they talk about healthy and, and unhealthy relationships in kind of to give a visualization of it. If you imagine two circles as the two people, so there are people who engage relationships in avoidant ways. So people could be married, but they're living like roommates or business partners. And it's like imagining the two circles, like not even overlapping or touching. They're just, the two circles are there, right? And they're side by side, but there's a space in between. And that's what they would call like avoidant attachment style, avoidant forms of relationships. The people are not really connected. They're too insecure to allow themselves to really be insecure, to lean into the vulnerability of relationships. Because really a relationship requires vulnerability. It requires the ability to allow yourself to be dependent. This is a whole nother piece, but, but one of the biggest challenges for us relationally is that we are taught that self-sufficiency is like the highest value. And that's why we're not so good at relationships. Because self-sufficiency is not the highest value. Yes, I want my nine-year-old to eventually you know, not need me to make him lunch every day for school, and I want them to remember to brush their teeth on their own. I want some self-sufficiency. But self-sufficiency is not an unadulterated value. The Western prioritization of self-sufficiency is actually, I think, one of the main causes of the dissolution of, of meaningful relationships. Because relationships require dependency. We're all dependent on each other. We're all dependent on each other all the time. There's no avoiding it. We're all constantly dependent on each other. And the more that we allow dependency, we are, we are secure enough to admit and acknowledge and lean into the dependency upon one another that's what creates the possibility of relationships. So people who don't have that, the two circles are just not even touching. Then you have the opposite extreme, which is the other form of an insecure relationship, which is when the two circles are completely enmeshed with one another. And that's not healthy either, because then that's not really a relationship. Because a relationship means that there's two parties, and the two parties are in relationship, two individuals who are in relationship. They are knowing each other and being known by each other. But if they become one circle, then they're not knowing each other and being known by each other. There's just one being. That's not a relationship anymore. So if I don't have a self, I can't actually be in a relationship. Just kind of, if you think about it, right? If I don't have an independent self, I actually can't be in a relationship. There's no relationship. There's just, I just become the extension of the other person. 
But then there's actually only one person. That's not a relationship anymore. What do you say? That's codependency. Codependency as they call it nowadays or enmeshment, right? Exactly, or anxious attachment style. Because I don't have a sense of self, so now there's no relationship. I'm just one with the other person, but in a negative way. The visualization of the healthy relationships are what they call interdependence. So the two circles look like a Venn diagram, right? And different, and there's a, there's a range, there's a spectrum of how they relate. It's not like it has to be exact. So sometimes the circles are like overlapping a lot with a little bit on the outs. Sometimes they're a lot out with a little bit overlapping and sometimes in the middle, but somewhere on that range is where we have healthy relationships because I have a sense of self. I can regulate myself. I can know what I need. I can know what I think. I can know who I am. And all of that is actually what allows for there to be a relationship because now there's two people. Now, the, now my spouse can know me because there's actually a me that's getting expressed to be known. I can actually know them because I'm not them. So now they can feel known by me. But if I'm so enmeshed with them, they're not gonna feel known by me because there's no me to know them, right? So there's, there's some way that there's that balance. And people who are in those kinds of healthy relationships are able to also be able to take space for themselves. So just to give an example, of one of the Gottman principles, one of the things they found in their, in their studies is that, the, the, again, the masters and the disasters, no difference in how much they fight. Less fighting is not a positive indicator about relationships. More fighting is not a negative indicator. The difference in the pattern is how they fight. And they found that there are three types of fighters. The three types are what we just talked about. The avoidance get into a fight, they blow up about something, and then they just pretend it never happened, and they never come back to it. So they avoid, the two circles are separate. The enmeshed or the codependent or the anxious fight and they never stop fighting about it. They won't give up on it. So you know like the advice, have you ever heard like, you know, like relational advice, that I've, people say like, never go to sleep in a fight? Yeah. Right, that's the worst advice ever. If you're in a fight, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right? If you're in a fight, go to sleep. It's the best thing you can do. Hopefully you can fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> however, however, the difference is you go to sleep and then when you wake up, the next day, or a week later, or however much time you need, you intentionally come back to re-engage the conflict. So the two circles that are separate, they will go to sleep, but then they'll wake up and pretend it never happened. And that creates underlying resentment and distress and, and wounding in the relationship, and that relationship is gonna have problems. The opposite extreme, the two couples that the two circles are just one, right? they will never go to sleep in the middle of a fight, which is gonna to lead to more escalation and more escalation and more escalation. And they're gonna they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna go into places that they're saying such damaging and hurtful things, it's gonna create a lot of problems, right? The secure interdependent relationships where you have the Venn diagram, what they're gonna do is when they're in a fight, they're gonna realize when it escalates beyond the point of productivity, they're gonna disengage they're capable of each taking their own space, like you said, of regulating themselves. They have their own friends in addition to each other. They have their own interests and hobbies in addition to each other. So they can go to their own space to do what they need to recollect themselves and ground themselves because they have their own independence. And then they will come back to it and re-engage. What the Gottmans actually found in their studies is that the happiest couples oftentimes have fights or conflicts or issues that never get resolved the entirety of their relationship. <laughs> but they know how to do that dance. So it's okay. It's okay to have that if you know how to do that dance. And sometimes they will, God willing, get resolved also. But the point is that, that it's not a problem because if you're able to have that interdependence where I have enough self and enough connection, then I can live with that. That can be okay, that can be healthy. That I can grow through that, I can live through that. Does that a little bit make sense to answer the question? Yeah, cool, okay. I, there was another hand before, over here, yeah. Uh, yeah, I almost forgot what I was gonna ask. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, uh, you, uh, I can ramble yeah, sometimes. So there, there was like no uh, traits other than how the person makes you feel about yourself that was a good determinant. Were there any traits that were negatively correlated mm -hmm. 
you know, like you mentioned just this one trait that's the only positive correlation. What about negative mm -hmm. correlation? You know, I can think of like if somebody has dire mental health issues, right, for right. example. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. No, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I don't know the answer offhand, but I would say, I would imagine the answer Rabbi, is yes. Can the question? Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> right. So I had oh, mentioned. Sorry, Mike. Uh, Mike wants to yes, yes. Hi, Mike. Uh, I, I, I had mentioned before that, that what their studies show is that character traits are not the way to predict uh, whether the relationship is going to be right for you in the long term, uh, but rather the way you feel about yourself when you're with this person is the predictor, uh, is, it has the predictive capacity for how this relationship will be in the long term. So the question was, are there any traits that, are, that, that function kind of as negative predictors? So I don't know the research to quote you offhand, but I would imagine that the answer is yes. Uh, that if somebody has, uh, you know, some uh, some real uh, challenges for sure with in terms of addiction, I would imagine uh, that that's that that has some uh, negative predictive capacity. Yeah. It's not a death sentence, God forbid, but it's but it's probably has negative um, predictive capacity. I would imagine narcissism would have that, uh, you know, different different things like that, um, I would imagine do. I don't know what the research is to give you like a better answer than that, but I imagine that there are some. But, but in terms of like, I guess the point though is, there's like a whole gamut of positive character traits that, you know, someone would sit down and, you know, or for example, you go onto a dating app, right? All jokes aside, you go onto a dating app and they're gonna ask you like what you're looking for, right? And there's gonna be like, a long variety of different positive character traits. The point that they're making is that none of those are a better recipe than any other, than a different, you know, you pick five of those, there's yeah. no better recipe there than picking a different yeah. five. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're probably right that there are some negative. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I actually have kind of like a similar question, not a similar, but in the topic. Uh, what I heard is that some people like feel like very, special unique with someone but it's just one side of it like mm. one person feels this way and another one did not mm. so what are you saying what about in that kind of situation yeah, yeah okay so the question was i'm getting better at this see <laughs> yeah, the, question, the question was the question was that uh what if one person in the relationship feels feels that sense of i feel like the best version of myself with this other person but both people don't feel that way uh, it's really sad it's really sad but i think that that, that that means, it, I mean, both people have to feel that way for it to be right. I think. You think that if you find someone else yeah. that will feel that way. Yes, correct, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Right, you'll find, you, it just means it's not right if both people yeah. don't feel that way, yeah. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked a lot about intuition, and we talked about how we were taught how to feel it, so can we talk about tips, strategies, habits, yeah. to get closer? It feels a little bit right now, like we're saying, like, when you know, you know. Like, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> 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 can I, can I answer with like the comment that I came Yeah, but only saying? if you first repeat the question. I know. I'll repeat the question yeah. and I'll give you the mic. The yeah. question was uh, how do we get better at intuition? Essentially, right? I, if I, right? How do we if so so if I'm right that unfortunately most of us, I'm sure some people here are an exception to this because there are people like this, but most of us are not taught a whole lot about trusting intuition and connecting to the, to the deeper knowledge within ourselves. So how do we get better at that, right? And so that, so that we can access that knowledge. Yeah, I just wanted to share like my personal experience and then I'll let him go that I, I, I went up and told him that like I've been in four meaningful relationships in my life and there were two times where I, I really felt that I wanted to be with the person and then two times where I really felt where I did not feel that way. So, you know, I just think like, you'll really feel it. Like, you really, really want to be with this person. So that's the place on earth where right now you want to be. Like in the same room, on the same bed as them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hear that. So in terms of like in general, how to get, how to increase, you know, our, our connection with that intuitive part of ourselves, I think that everyone's different, but I think that it means Trying to connect with the parts of life and the parts of ourself that are not as evaluation based. You know, it's not about uh, how well I perform at something. 
or how, what the outcome is or an accomplishment. And it's more about the experience itself. Hmm. Just actually being in the experience, which usually means doing things that have a lot of slowing down, right? Really slowing ourselves down. Taking time to actually check in with what do I feel? What do I notice? Asking myself these kinds of questions. Of what do I feel right now? What mood am I in? You know, there's like a, in the last century, there was a great rabbi, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who was a, one of my foremost uh, mentors. Uh, I, never, he was, I was very, very young when he passed away, but, but he's a person that I read a lot of and spent a lot of time listening to recordings of him. In one, in one recording, he said the following line that I just loved. He said, when you're reading the Torah, when you're reading <clears throat> verses, whatever you're up to, he said, one, one, way that you have to, one way that you're supposed to study is you're supposed to ask yourself, what mood does this part of the Torah put me in? If you want to actually understand what it's saying, you have to ask yourself, what mood does it put me in? That's not a question most people ask when they study Torah. <laughs> and this was a giant Talmudic analytical... This is one of the biggest the geniuses giant. of the history, you know, in, in the last century. Um, you have to ask yourself, what mood does it put me in? So I'd apply that beyond Torah. In general, it's, it's, too, it's slowing down and tuning into those types of questions. It's if you have any interest whatsoever in music or art or nature, doing more of that, even if... And especially if you're not good at it, because it's moving out of the evaluatory experience of it. Instead of the assessment version of life, it's the experiential version of life. So it's spending more time in that way, in nature, drawing. It's, you know, I'll tell you a crazy idea, right? This sounds ridiculous, right? You get home from a date, take out a blank piece of paper and an assortment of colors and just draw without thinking. I'm serious. I have clients do this in therapy. It's called gush art. Not thinking, not premeditated art. You're not trying to draw something. It's not about, do you, are you good at art? It's just letting it come out. Gush art and see what happens, right? And, and you could do that in all sorts of things, right? All, all sorts of experiences. But, but taking more time to be reflective in this kind of open-ended way uh, that doesn't, again, not to the exclusion of pros and cons lists or analysis or thinking, it's not to the exclusion of it, but it's an addition to it. So leaning into all those parts of our, of our life, our self, like you're walking down the street one night and it's like, instead of hurrying home, assuming you're in a safe uh, neighborhood, instead of hurrying home, see if you can walk as slowly as you can. Like see how slowly you can walk. But don't make it about like, let me see how slowly I can walk, right? Because then it's an evaluation again. It's like, hmm. What's it like to like just feel my feet on the ground like shifting and to like notice my body move so naturally in a way that I never even really pay attention to it as I take a step or like just breathing. Like a lot of ways of slowing down and connecting to aspects of our life that we're usually just like taking for granted. Right? So certainly I think meditation is a really good way to do this. Uh, there's an app now putting out meditations called Attached. Um, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but seriously, there's a much better meditation app than mine, in all seriousness, um, that's still currently free. It'll probably get good, and then they'll start charging money, but right now you should jump on it. It's called Insight Timer. I use that every day. Awesome. Good for you. It's so good. You can it's so good. Own, yeah. And you can also just listen to different challenges. Yeah, yeah. So sub subscribe to my app, but then don't listen to mine, okay? Just <laughs> listen to Insight Timer, but that way we, we both, yeah? Okay. So... Um, <laughs> But, um, but like God, meditation is definitely a good way to go. But any of these kind of like more expressive art type experiences that most of us don't really spend all that much time doing, I think is a really good way to go. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot because relative to where most of us are, again, I don't know you, but relative to where most of us are, even if you just do a tiny, tiny bit of this, it's more than most of us are doing, right? And it's opening up a different part of ourselves. Is that a little bit give us yeah, some pathways? You. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. How much time? Let's, one more question. Let's do one. Let's okay. do one more question. Then officially call, and then people okay. want to. Great. Know, yeah. Tackle Rabbi Tevishevsky yeah. the rest of the night. It's great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Mine was just a comment back on that. Oh, okay. I think that part of it is how I teach my kids. Um, is a lot of you learning more about yourself, so that when you're in that same situation, 
that you kind of know how to control stuff because you're able to understand more your body, your thoughts. Um, so when you're trying to figure out like how to be more intuitive with yourself, like when you've had those situations before, you're able to kind of reflect in that moment rather than having to always aftermath think of like those things um, that you're able to like pause. And so a lot of it is kind of those senses and figure out like how does your body feel. So I've done the drawing things too, but sometimes I have my kids sit there for two minutes of just like taking in like what's what do you hear, what do you smell, what do you taste, and a lot of it is like I could feel my neck just like moving or I could feel like my hair on it. But like taking in what some of those things that like you you take for granted. Um, but it helps in other situations so that you're able when you're moving forward that you're like oh, that's why I feel this way in this situation, or that's why I feel uncomfortable, that's why I feel good, I liked this, I didn't like this, that you're kind of recognizing more than just like taking things for granted. Yeah, I'd say this just, uh, I guess to finish up, the, what, one other thing I'll just add to it, um, by the way, just another example, like in addition to, you know, you could color, a different example would be uh, what they call gush poetry instead of gush art. Like, you don't have to be good at poetry, just write. Just allow allow free expression. I think that that. But we just add one small piece, and then we'll we'll finish. Um, is is paying attention to your body, to sensations in the body, sensations in the body. The body is actually the deepest revealer of the subconscious. It really is. This would require a lot more time to go into. But notice sensations in your body. So your heart is pounding, butterflies in your stomach. You are just you know shaking your leg more than you normally would you have an ache somewhere. Sometimes it's nothing, it's just, I don't know, whatever. Some, that's, that's rare. Sometimes, but it could be. Sometimes it's an actual kind of like medical thing, right, and that obviously needs <laughs> medical attention. Yeah. But very, very, very often, your body is sending you messages of wisdom that it has. Let me give you the easiest example that we all relate to. When your hand is in a fire, how do you know to take your hand out? God forbid. Because you're in pain, right? <laughs> Now, why, do you why should you take your hand out? Not because you're in pain. That's not why you should take your hand out of the fire. You should take your hand out of the fire because your hand is burning. Your body is telling you that your hand is burning by sending you pain messages. The sensation of pain is the communication device of your internal knowledge that something bad is happening. It's trying to send you a message and wake you up. We all have things like that going on all the time. When our heart beats faster, it's telling us something. When there's butterflies or something, it's telling us something. When I'm tapping my foot uncontrollably, it's telling me something. When there's a tightness in my jaw, it's telling me something. And if I ask myself on a gut level, without trying to think up here, on a gut level, what is this sensation in my jaw saying to me? What's the first thing that comes up without thinking? Right? What is this kind of like flushed, like dissociative feeling, like this, I'm like becoming more aloof, whatever it is. What is my body saying to me? First thing that comes up. That is an that's another way of really accessing this deeper knowledge. Another piece to it, the body wisdom. There's a lot more on that. Okay, thank you so much. This has been amazing. <laughs>